Hi guys, so today I wanted to give you a video on my German Blue Ram breeding tank. So I'm going to go through all the fish for you and then tell you a little bit about my goals for this tank. So first in here I have three black German Blue Rams. But you see one of the females here. And here's the male here. These were originally bred by Dean from Dean's Fish Room. If you watch Aquarium Co-op, you've probably seen videos featuring him on YouTube. And they're, I think they're a short ways from breeding. The females are still a bit skinny. I don't think they're filling up with eggs yet. But hopefully in the next uh, few weeks to a month, we should see some action out of them. This is the male. There's plenty of food in the tank, but he's still begging for more, which he may receive, but uh, not while I'm holding the camera. There are three black rams from Dean's Fish Room, three gold rams, which you see the largest male here. I believe I have two males. Here's the other male gold ram, and then one female. This is definitely a female. You can tell by her plump pink belly. It's an indication that she's close to breeding condition and uh, the pink belly is a very good giveaway that a ram is a female which it's a little harder to notice on a gold ram but it's still pretty obvious there you can see if she would turn but she has some good gold coloration I'm sorry not gold pink coloration in her belly and now we'll move on to this guy. This is a tank raised German Blue Ram. And he is just gorgeous. My favorite type of German Blue Ram is just the regular color morph, selectively bred to intensify their wild colors, which is what this guy is. And he is the epitome of why I love rams. He's just gorgeous. Beautiful dorsal fin, nice ventral fins. Lots of personality at this moment, very aggressive as you can see. But rams tend to be mostly um, non contact aggression. You'll see a lot of chasing, but not much physical nipping and damage caused to other fish, which means that uh, you may see stress occurring, but generally you won't see physical damage done. And often it's not fatal, especially if you really cram the rams into a tank like I'm doing here. In this tank I have 10 rams in a 15. So they're sort of, the aggression's so spread out they can't really kill each other. So this is the male selectively bred German Blue. I have one more selectively bred German Blue, which you see here. And this is one of the first rams I've ever had that I've had trouble telling the sex. Now when I originally bought it, I bought this ram and the one I just showed you as a pair and it's sort of in between because when I first look at it it looks female to me and I base that on sort of the head shape the behavior and just I don't know there's something about once you've kept a fish long enough you just get an instinct for what gender it is at least I do and this feels like a female to me but I've seen her, and you can see in a previous video I posted, I should say he or she, um, fighting with the other ram in the style of ramming that two males will normally do, which is a bit confusing. So it's possible this is actually a male, but um, it's very hard for me to tell at this point. I think within a month or so it'll grow enough that I'll know for sure. And you don't really see much of a pink belly on it. It's fairly submissive, which sort of suggests female, but it doesn't really have any very clear indications of which it is. So, only time will really tell which gender that ram is. Now, because initially the only two rams I had were this German blue ram male, and the one of unknown gender. And once I was questioning whether or not it was a female, 
The next rams I got were this one, which is a female wild ram. Which you see right here. The colors are much more muted on this ram. Um, the main ways you can tell this is a female are the blue sheen shining through in the upper portion of its central body. Uh, normally with a male you would see more black and you wouldn't really be able to see that sheen. And then here is the other female. Actually now I can't tell if it's the same one or a different one. But there are two wild female rams. Here's one. Here's the other. And they have much more muted color than the selectively bred ones as you can see. But I'm interested to see how colorful they'll get in breeding condition. Because female rams, when spawning, have amazing color that may be even better than the males. It's pretty amazing. I'll link a video up above of a previous pair of rams I had spawning where you can just see the insane colors they get while spawning and defending eggs. So that is all for the rams. There are three black rams, three gold rams, two selectively bred German blue rams, and two wild rams. I forgot to mention, the gold rams are also from Dean's Fish Room. They are, I'm guessing, offspring from a pair of black rams, because I know uh, black rams tend to produce mainly gold offspring, with a smaller percentage of their offspring actually being black. So I'm interested to see if I can breed these black rams, what sort of ratio I'll get in terms of color morphs out of the spawns. So that'll be 10 rams in here. Three blacks, three golds, two selectively bred normal coloration, and two wilds. Now let's do Corydoras because they're the other fish that I'm actually seriously breeding in here. So right here you can see one of the Sturbi Corydoras. Um, Sturbis are one of my favorites for coloration and they're also a good one to spawn because they go for a pretty high, um, high price. They're usually about $10 a piece in most fish stores. And these are really starting to plump up. Um, so I'm hoping I can get some spawning out of them in the next month as well. Although I've never actually spawned Sturbis so I'm not totally sure um, if they're old enough and large enough that they will spawn. But they're definitely healthy, and you can see they're foraging very actively here, which is a good indication of healthy quarries. So they're doing well. There's six of those in here. And then I also have six Corydoras fibrosis, which you see three of them here. They're one of the three main types of um, dwarf Corydoras, which include Corydoras pygmaeus, Corydoras hostatus, and these, which are Corydoras fibrosis. Of those three types, I've only kept Hebrosis. I would say I definitely prefer Hebrosis to Pygmaeus, as their, um, their color pattern is slightly more interesting, and I would say their behavior is more like a traditional Corydora, where they stay towards the bottom more. I've also spawned these pretty successfully in the past. I've produced probably around 20 babies from them. Sorry about that guys, my video actually hit maximum length so I had to cut to another uh, recording. So as I was saying, I'll, I'll link to a video up above of the original Corydoras fibrosis I got. I think I originally got five of them. And I was able to breed them out and probably get about 20 offspring, which was pretty good and it didn't really take any effort. I had them in with some German blue rams that I was growing out from Fry and they produced fry without me knowing it until I realized I had more fibrosis than I started with. So they're definitely a pretty easy quarry to breed in my experience. And I would definitely recommend them if you have a smaller tank but still want that corridor that hangs out towards the bottom and uh, could possibly reprodu reproduce for you as well. So corridor fibrosis are another one I have in here. Now those are the two Corydoras I have. I have six of each of those, of the Sturbis and the Fibrosis. And now I'll go into the species that I don't really intend to breed, but are in here sort of as grow outs and sort of just because this is the best tank for them to survive in. So here you see some clown loaches. And they're doing very well also. They're still pretty small for clown loaches, only about two and a half inches. 
Um, but they're, I think they're growing pretty quickly for clown loaches. They are known to be pretty slow growers, so we're not really expecting them to explode in size anytime soon. But eventually I plan on relocating them to another tank. This ram really wants to show off. He, he doesn't want to be off camera. Um, but they're doing well. Uh, there are definitely no live snails in here. They're taking care of that for me. You can see a bunch of snail shells everywhere where they've cleared them all out. I have a bunch of ram's horn snails growing in other tanks that I'll probably end up feeding to these guys as they are ravenous eaters. And they're really fun to watch. So, uh, yeah, that sort of gives you a look at the beauty of a clown lunch. They're definitely beautiful fish. And then we'll move on to the tetras. Well, before I move on to the tetras, let me cover this one zebra danio, which I do not intend for this fish to be in here. However, I don't think it's worth stirring up the whole tank trying to catch one zebra danio. So I'm just letting this fish thrive in here um, until it becomes necessary to take it out, which it really isn't. It seems to be doing well. Uh, even though they really should be kept in groups, this danio seems perfectly happy in here and definitely isn't willing to be caught easily. So for the time being, he or she will spend its life in here. Now, as you can see here, the red and blue fish are cardinal tetras. I have, I believe, 13 of them. It's a little bit tough to count. They, move, they don't move that quickly, but when you're trying to count 13 fish, it's a bit of a challenge to track them all down at once. They're doing well. I believe these are captive raised cardinal tetras. Um, I recently purchased some wild cardinal tetras to sort of compare the coloration and they're being housed in another tank. I'm planning on probably doing a video in the future where I compare their coloration to see if the difference is evident between wild and tank raised cardinals. Um, if you're not familiar with it, there's a nonprofit organization called Project Piava. I'll put a link in the description. It's essentially a project which does research into the sustainability of wild caught fish in the Amazon. I believe mainly in northern Brazil in the Rio Negro. And one of the main focuses of the research is on cardinal tetras and their wild collection. Because for a long time there's been a stigma surrounding wild caught fish that um, wild caught is automatically bad because you're removing something from the wild and sort of exercising extractive practices on the habitat, which at face value does seem like something that would be bad. However, um, one problem is there aren't a lot of good ways for people to make money um, that live in rural areas of the Amazon, or rural and undeveloped areas. And the alternatives to wild catching fish and selling them are much more damaging. They include things like slash and burn farming, um, mining, which can release things like mercury into the rivers, and many other practices like drug trade and other things like that that really cause more damage than wild catching of fish. And it's actually been found, especially with cardinal tetras, that they can harvest a large portion of their population with no real harm being done. Um, because they really adopt a strategy in the wild where they spawn in massive numbers um, in anticipation of a large amount of die-off. So whether 10,000 fish go to spawn versus 100,000, you'll ultimately end up with a comparable number of survivors as most of them die out as they compete for limited resources. So that's just a little uh, rant, I guess, about why wild-caught fish may not always be such a bad thing. Now, there are definitely scenarios where that's not true. There are fish like the zebra pleco, which comes from the Rio Singu, which is a river which is actually um, in significant danger of being destroyed right now because of mining and um, damming in Brazil. Um, wild catching of fish like that, which are going extinct, can be very harmful. And they're often smuggled out of Brazil into Colombia where they're sold. Um, so wild caught fish aren't always a good thing or always a bad thing. It's a little more species and scenario specific. 
So I'd encourage everyone to not adopt such an all or nothing uh, approach to whether wild caught is good or bad, but rather do a little more research into the species you're looking at to find out if uh, that fish is sustainable to purchase wild caught or not. Cardinal tetras are definitely a fish I would recommend you purchase wild caught. It's been found that there's really no damage done at all in harvesting them, at least in the way they do at this moment. And um, honestly, I don't know this for sure, but I have a theory that the wild caught ones tend to have much brighter red coloration uh, than captive raised, which why else would you buy a cardinal except for the red? So um, highly recommend that. Now, after that long rant, we have the final fish in this tank, which are these Pristella tetras. Pristella tetras are one of my favorite tetras of all time. They were one of the first tetras I ever kept. I think the second one I ever had after neons. And I had about four of them that I believe lived for me for seven years, from when I was in about second grade to when I was a freshman in high school. So they're definitely a very long-lived tetra. They're simple yet elegant. They have a nice red tail and that yellow, black, white tip fin on top and bottom. They're very active. They're ravenous eaters. Um, if you drop in a cube of bloodworms or brine shrimp, they will slam the hell out of it. It's very fun to watch. Um, yeah, overall, I really love Pristella Tetras. There are 12 of them in here. I have seen them exhibit spawning behavior in the past in other tanks I've kept and potentially I could try to spawn them again with these, but obviously with how stocked this tank is, an egg scatterer like that is going to have a lot of trouble reproducing. So they could potentially be a fish I could spawn in the future, but it would more be uh, a project for an accomplishment and for fun than it would be for actual profit, where I would say the corridors and rams in here are um, enjoyment, but also profit focused for me. So I believe that's all the fish to cover in this tank. I do have one dwarf Sagittaria plant, which you see right here. Um, I'm hoping that I can carpet that out over the length of the tank over time. I'm planning on just leaving it in the rock bowl pot and letting it shoot out runners, hopefully to cover the entire tank in time. So we'll see how that goes. But yeah, I'll just run back through the fish quickly for you. So in here there are 13 cardinal tetras, 12 pristella tetras, 10 German blue rams, which are three blacks, three golds, two tank raised German blue rams, and two wild German blue rams, six corridors sturbi, six corridors hebrosis, and one zebra danio. And if I didn't mention it, which I can't remember if I did, 12 cardinal tetras. So yeah, thanks for watching guys. And I will keep you posted on this tank. I'm excited to see breeding, which hopefully will go on in the next month or so. You can see right here, this gold ram male on the left and the female on the right seem to be thinking about spawning on this rock. So. Hopefully you'll see a video soon on their eggs, but we'll see. Hope everyone's having a good start to 2021, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I just wanted to take a moment to apologize for the screeching you heard during the video. There's a pretty obnoxious bird uh, in the fish store that I'm currently housing my tanks at. And he tends to get really angry when he hears anyone talking or playing music or anything, and they're not directly interacting with him. So uh, thanks for tolerating that throughout the video, and uh, thanks again for watching. Um, yeah, have a great day, everyone.